Yeah. yeah. Okay, welcome to Architects of Change, live conversations with change makers who are moving humanity forward. And I'm really happy to be welcoming to this table, to this space, uh, an author, a filmmaker, and advocate, an agitator, an educator of all things, uh, Josh Tickell, and this book called Kiss the Ground, How the Food You Can Eat, Eat Can Reverse Climate Change, Heal Your Body, and Ultimately Save Our World. And this new book, it's called The Revolution Generation, How Millennials Can Save America and the World Before It's Too Late. Uh, they're kind of connected, but not. And I want to say that I met you or heard about you from my friend Susie Scheinberg, who's a mom who I think was really way ahead of the curve in terms of people that I knew talking about um, our food, where our food is coming from, how it's affecting the climate, and what we can do about it. And I can honestly say some people were like, woohoo, Susie, but she was ahead of the curve and right. So I want to thank her for introducing me to you. And let's begin with this because it's the newest book, Josh, mm -hmm. The Revolution Generation, How Millennials Can Save the World Before It's Too Late. So many people feel it's we're in a hopeless situation. It is too late. I'm very hopeful. Why do you think it's up to millennials? And they say like, oh God, one more thing we have to do, now save the world. Right, well obviously it's an overburdened generation to begin with. Look at everything they're inheriting in terms right. of the systemic problems that we face. Well, they're getting that even in And what do you mean by that, sense. like what in particular? Look at things like climate change, right. global warming. So. You know, you look at older generations, Generation X, Baby Boomers, things are divided along ideological lines mm -hmm. when you deal with an issue like climate change. But when you look at the millennial generation, they're not divided along ideological lines. So mm -hmm. whether they're identifying as an independent, Republican, or Democrat, the vast majority of millennials believe that climate change is human-made and they believe that we have to do something about it. Don't you think boomers feel like that? I, I'm a boomer and I, everybody I talk to thinks that climate change is real and we got to do something about it. Surveys we, indicate we, that it's very much a partisan issue within the baby boomer generation. Well, maybe partisan or a small majority of people don't believe in the scientific evidence. But you're also right in this book, Kiss the Ground, that climate change is actually connected to what we're eating. Mm -hmm. Now, that I think m a lot of people, and certainly boomers, did not get that message growing up at all. Um, and so how is that, and how is that connected to the revolution generation? Well, when you look at systemic change, climate change, for right. instance, is a systemic change. You and I can do a lot, but ultimately this is a social shift. Right. So when we get into the dynamics of Kiss the Ground, we talk about something called bio-sequestration mm -hmm. or drawdown. How do we remove the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere and put it in the soil? Mm -hmm. Turns out we've put, since the birth of the Industrial Revolution, a thousand gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere. So you and I can install solar panels, we can drive electric cars, we can do all of those energy efficiency things. Mm -hmm. And that thousand gigatons is still gonna be in the atmosphere warming the planet. Mm -hmm. So the big question is not how do we get to the end of fossil fuels? We have that vision as a society. Mm -hmm. It's what are we gonna do about the CO2 that we put up there? Right. And that's where the soil comes in. That's where the ground comes in. The only mechanism that we have for absorbing that much CO2 quickly that we know about is soil. Soil will absorb CO2 and fix it if the soil is taken care of. So how do we do that? Well, through a process of agriculture called regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture, and that's not up to the millennials. We can all do that, or that's a, a really a policy issue too. Exactly, yeah. we can all do that. Obviously through food choices, we can support farmers who are not tilling the land, who are keeping cover crops on the land, but then you get into, well, why are they tilling? Why are they growing monocrops like soy and corn? Mm -hmm. Turns out that's a policy issue. Right. Because we pay them through our tax dollars to do that. Right. And they're going out of business. And we don't pay them to take care of the soil like you're advocating. Exactly. Right. So how can people who are maybe hearing this for the first time and going, wow, I didn't make that connection, I can maybe vote for somebody in the midterms that advocates for this. I don't know if there's anybody in particular that you want to shout out that's on this page. 
Well, I'm not going to endorse any candidate specifically. Okay. But what I will say is we have a huge wave of progressive young people, some of whom identify as Democrats, some of whom identify as independents, and some mm -hmm. of whom even identify as Republicans, mm -hmm. who are running in this midterm election. Right. And what we see in that group of people is a big willingness to embrace concepts like regenerative agriculture and push them through on the state level. And we're seeing even movement on the national level. This new farm bill, even though it's still stuck in the sort of GMO corn and soy world, has the first language for taking care of soils for carbon sequestration. So that is, that's very exciting to you. It's positive. Right, so yeah. what, what can people, like what could I do today? You talked about you know getting solar panels, driving an electric car, recycling, right? But what could I do today in terms of how I eat that could affect um, the climate change? Two big things. Okay. The first thing we can do is deal with our food waste differently. So food waste is ubiquitous. Everybody contributes it to it to some degree. But if we start composting on an individual level and also on a city level, we reduce the amount of greenhouse gases per capita tremendously. So one of the profiles that we do in the book is San Francisco. San Francisco has the largest municipal compost program in the country. They're up to like 90-something percent efficiency in terms of their composting. Wow. Yeah. So in terms of advocating for city leaders who have that, Correct. and individually we should all be composted. Absolutely, it's easy, anyone can do it, and you make dirt, it's free. So that's one thing, uh, I think we all wonder like what can we do or what difference does an individual uh, make? Uh, that's one thing. And then, to are there other things in terms of how we eat? Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about the inside of the supermarket, the yep. outside of the supermarket. Explain that to people. Yep. Well, this is, this is a known concept by now, but, but folks who are new to this conversation may not realize mm -hmm. the food on the inside of the super, supermarket is really reprocessed corn and soy. Mm -hmm. It's all the byproducts of the monocrop industry. So if you look at America, the middle of the country grows those monocrops. That's the flyover states, right? The places where you see those big circles. Mm -hmm. What's growing in those circles? Mostly corn and soy. Those mm -hmm. are the two biggest products we produce agriculturally. Mm -hmm. What's in the middle of our supermarket? Corn and soy. It's made pretty. It's put in a box, a bag, or a carton. It's got corn syrup in it, so it tricks your brain, makes you think you should eat it. You should not eat it. That's the first thing. So in terms of your body... So you're body, saying don't, don't eat anything that's in a bag, in a box? Look, the, the reality of modern life is we're going to do that, yeah. right? But yes. can you reduce that? I definitely that? am going to do yeah, that. Right? Can we yes, reduce it? Can yes. we reduce it? Can we shop more around the edges of the supermarket where the fresh produce is, where the fresh ingredients are? That's where the real value is, nutritionally as well as to the soil. Another big thing we take on in the book and the upcoming film, Kiss the Ground, is meat. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that is that uh, the whole kind of, and I think that we live in a country that a lot of people like meat, but there has been a big movement into more plant-based diet, a lot of vegans, mm. right? Yeah. And uh, the meat industry is obviously a um, very important one to the country, but that is directly affecting our climate. It is. And we make a different distinction in the book than most people make because the majority of the conversation around meat is just don't eat meat. Right. That's not or the conversation. Reduce your consumption. Reduce of your meat. consumption. Right. And, and, that, and that makes sense on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. We eat a, a tremendous amount of meat per capita in the U.S. Much of that meat is bad meat. It's from something called a CAFO, a confined animal feed operation. Mm -hmm. Horrible for the for the animals. Horrible for us, and horrible for the environment. So always to ask for grass-fed beef if you are a beef eater, yep. right? And also somebody mentioned to me, ask for it to be grass-fed completed. Yes, which that's I the key. Which I didn't know. Grass I, finished. Grass finished. Yes. So I asked that in the market and they're like, what? I said, yeah, yeah no, I was told grass finished. And the guy's like, well, it's not grass finished, but it's grass fed. I'm like, oh, gotta go. Yeah, right. that's So it. that's not something that people, I think, hear enough about. So could you explain that? So Very important distinction. Yes. All cattle begin life on grass. So all meat-born cattle, where they're going into a meat packing plant, they begin life on grass. And at some stage, usually after a year of life, they're moved into a CAFO to fatten them up and get them ready for sale. So when you say grass-fed, does that mean all beef? Or does that mean that that cow 
was fed grass until the end of its life. Mm -hmm. Because most cows are fed grass for a portion of their life, and then they're moved on to corn and soy, which is not natural for the animal. And so how does that affect our climate? Two totally different scenarios. And we look at both scenarios in the book. What we're seeing now is a new generation of ranchers and farmers that are doing something called mob grazing. They're taking cattle, packing them together tightly, and moving them almost daily to a different area. And what this does, as they look at the level of grass, is it actually builds topsoil. And anytime you build topsoil, you're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. So in Uh one scenario, Mm -hmm. we can use these animals, which are in many ways like buffalo, which Mm -hmm. we used to have many more of. We can use them like buffalo to build the soil. Wow. Uh Whereas in the other scenario, the scenario that's happening mostly now, Mm We're using those animals in an unnatural way to prop up an industry that is basically only there because we subsidize it with tax dollars. I, I don't want farmers to be on welfare. Right. I want farmers to be profitable and make the, make the planet healthy. So you're saying that there are actually farmers, ranchers who are, are, are they millennials? Are they there millennials? Are some, yeah, there are some millennials doing this. Who I, are actually. ranching, farming yes. in a different way. Yeah, yeah. So they're using, you know, they're kind of grass completing their beef, Mm -hmm. and they're also helping the soil, and they're helping the environment. Yep. And so how does that get supported? How does somebody support that? Well, that is through your relationship with your food, with your farmer, okay? Mm -hmm. And people look at this and they go, oh, well, you know, I don't have time to shop at the farmer's market. That's only for wealthy people who have that sort of extra income. And the question is, where do you spend your food budget now? Because if you look at the average American food budget, a tremendous amount goes to soda, processed food, chips, things that are found in that center of the supermarket Mm -hmm. for you and your family. The question is, can you shift some of that budget? Maybe that means you're going to eat less meat, but you're going to support a different type of food. So, but I go to the farmer's market and I don't, you know, there's nobody there talking about how they're farming their beef. Yeah. So how do I even find that? Well, you carry a copy, kiss the ground around, and you talk to those guys who are selling meat. Say, okay, great, you're selling meat in your cooler. Where is it raised? How is it raised? Is it grass finished? That's the first question. Right, right. Once you get through that, we need to move into the question of, have you experimented with mob grazing? Mob grazing. Mm-hmm. Have you experimented with mob grazing? And if they look at you like you are out of your mind... You're out of there. You're out of there. Yeah. Don't what, eat it. Well, why would you want to eat something that hasn't been properly nourished and that's not nourishing the soil anyway? So so much of what you're saying is also that up to the... It's educating the consumer mm-hmm. and the consumer making informed choices um, with their food, who they vote for, voting for people who think about their food. Mm. Well, we're, we're a fortunate society. Right. Most of us vote three times a day. We vote with our forks, we vote with our knives. Mm-hmm. So can those votes count as well as the vote at the ballot box? And so when you say here the revolution generation, um, you know, boomers like to think that they were the ones that kind of up to, upended everything. Mm. What are these millennials going to do that boomers didn't do? Well, there are a couple of key distinctions that we need to look at. First of all, we're not saying boomers uh, didn't do a great right, job. Right, yeah. Yeah, boomers really set the standard. I mean, if you look at the crowning achievements of mm-hmm. the progressive baby boomer generation, mm-hmm. hey, passed an amendment to the U.S. Constitution allowing 18-year-olds to vote. That's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Uh, The civil rights movement and the legislation, the federal legislation that was passed through that. Mm -hmm. Amazing achievements. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing within the millennial generation is encouraging. We're not there yet, Mm -hmm. but we are seeing a lot of young leaders take on huge causes and really move national conversations forward. Whether it's around gun control, Mm -hmm. whether it's around climate, whether it's around other progressive issues, women's rights, we are seeing a generation really rising up. And the big realization for millennials, and this is often the big like, aha, they're the largest voting bloc, Mm -hmm. not just in the US, but in the history of the United States. And just a few percentage points, one way or another, shifts national elections. We saw that, that difference between 2008 
-hmm. and 2016. I think the figure though I heard President, uh, former President Obama talk about how few young people actually vote. So while they may be the largest voting bloc mm -hmm. and that they can shift elections, they're not voting. That's correct. So well, how do uh, we have a revolution they, with yeah. a generation that doesn't vote? They are and they aren't voting. Uh -huh. We've got about 80%. I think he said one in five. I, I don't, don't quote me on that. Mm. It's, uh, I, I'd have to go back and look at the actual figures, but it was an astounding figure. Yeah. It, I mean, it is astounding that we have 80 million or so millennials in the US. Mm -hmm. We have about a 75 to 80% voter registration within that age group. Of that 75 to 80%, we've got about a 50% turnout to the polls. Mm -hmm. So the potential is huge. The reality is that traction hasn't really happened since 2008. Mm -hmm. If we'd had the same turnout in 2016 that we did in 2008, Hillary Clinton would be president right now. Mm -hmm. So that's the power, not of, even of the whole generation. We're talking about five to 12 percent increase in voting numbers. Very, I very small have, margin. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, that I'm a boomer. I don't know what it is, but I, I don't understand people who don't vote. It just is beyond me uh, that you have that right, you have that gift, mm. you have that blessing. And you don't use it. It's so like, what? I don't, I don't get it. And so, you know, there's always that feeling like, oh, it's not going to make any difference. We saw in 2016 how small many of the margins mm. were. Yeah. It does make a difference. You look at so many of the races, even primaries, that are super, super close. Um, and so I guess it's, the question is how millennials can save the world, save America and the world. Uh, they've also gotten a bit of a bad rap. I have uh, several millennial children and they are always complaining that people think that they're, you know, don't have a work ethic, that they're lazy, they're entitled, and of course there are always people in that. But there's also a lot, as you say, who want to take on, who really want meaning in their work, mm -hmm. uh, who want to take on the larger issues that are confronting all of us and believe that they can. Two things about that. One is, you know, we're doing a college tour with the Revolution Generation now, and it's amazing. What are you learning? A lot, a lot. Every stop is just a rich trove of questions, information, sharing. You know, what we see as the millennial generation, this, this kind of cliche that we've all heard, lazy, narcissistic, entitled, self-absorbed, that's one of the first questions we ask on the tour is, how many of you have ever been labeled one of these things? 100% of the hands go up. How many of you believe it's true? Zero hands go up. This, this, I, what I assert in the book is that this, this cliche is more than that. It's a stereotype with an agenda. And the agenda is to disenfranchise a generation that's very powerful by its very numbers. Mm -hmm. So when you say, you know, what's going to be the Conspiracy. future? Conspiracy. Eh, you know, let's see the results. Yeah. You know, let's. We're talking about we're talking about people showing up to the polls. Right. If you can make people not care enough right. to not show up, right. You have effectively disenfranchised. So them. who's making them feel that they shouldn't care? I think that the entire generation, for its entire lifehood has been inundated with the message that it is lazy, that it is narcissistic, and that it is self-entitled. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy at some stage. So, uh, but the thing is, as you said, when you go on these college tours, people say they've heard it, but they don't believe it. So they're fighting yeah. against that yes. stereotype. They don't believe it. And so I would step back and say, okay, prove it. I think what we're seeing is proof that hasn't been realized yet. Love that. Okay, if you're a millennial, proof, but hasn't been realized. Mm. So it hasn't been realized by the larger public. It hasn't, it hasn't been, been realized by the media. It hasn't been realized by our system. So let's break down the, the, the political identification of the millennial generation. Mm -hmm. Over 50% identify as an independent. That's me. So I'm a millennial. So let's say you and I are millennials, for yes. instance. Let's okay. say we are, right? We're okay. independents. Right. We go... We go into the, to an election cycle. Right. Here we are, boom, midterms coming up. Okay, you should vote. You get that message on yes. Facebook, and there's all these videos yes. being produced. Vote, vote, vote. And you go, great, I'm going to vote, but I'm an independent. Let's look at my choices. A, B. Right. But I'm C. Right. Where's my choice? Right. 
So what we saw in the run-up to the 2016 election was that huge support for Bernie Sanders. That didn't mm -hmm. come out of nowhere. That came out of a very large, wasn't everyone, but it was over 50%. Mm -hmm. And the disallowance of a third party in this country mm -hmm. has effectively shut out a lot of people in this generation who want to participate. Mm -hmm. So I think the bigger question is not, are we going to see a huge voting turnout in this year, 20, 2018, or are we going to see a huge voting turnout in 2020? It's what's the system of governance going to look like mm -hmm. in six years, seven years, eight years, nine years, ten years, mm -hmm. when the majority of the millennial population matriculates into power? Mm -hmm. And I think what we're going to see is a complete and radical disruption of the two-party system in this country. I actually agree with that. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people that are cross-generation who agree with that. And there's a lot going on um, in that space, which I think is super exciting. So if, you're, if you would like people to take away that kiss the ground is for millennials, boomers, Gen Xers, Absolutely. anybody who's eating food yes. and thinking about um, climate change and your really f focuses think of them together yes think of them together uh, the environment and policy it, they are one thing and and for many reasons the power structures that we have in this country keep trying to tear them apart they are not separate so think when you eat think about what you're eating and how it's impacting um, the climate that you're breathing and the climate that you are living in ask the informed questions about where the food is coming from mm -hmm. uh, that you're consuming. So be a, um, an informed consumer. And if you're um, the parent of a millennial or if you're a millennial, get this book, The Revolution Generation. What do you think is the, I mean, you talk a lot about them taking on different uh, parts. What's the thing that you think is the most exciting thing? I mean, what, why did you want to write this book? To dispel the myth? Uh, to dispel the myth, I, I think the most exciting thing is what young people today can do when they feel a sense of empowerment. What's available to them, as opposed to what was available to you and me, just yeah. in terms of the technological reach and the ability to connect with like-minded people to form effective social movements that have specific objectives, specific policy objectives, which we're starting to see now. I mean, look at all the young people running for office here in 2018. We are gonna see some real disruption starting this year just because they can connect with each other, create very clear objectives, and move together. That's cool. When you, when you go through the college campuses, are you seeing men and women, different races, different um, genders, um, um, different economic backgrounds. Are you seeing them come together? We're, we seem to be inundated with, you know, kind of everything is on the extreme, but do you see really um, people with common sense who have common dreams and believe in the goodness of this country and want to make it better? Yes, and, and that gives me great hope because this was a generation, among the many messages they got, one of the core messages they got was teamwork, 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 teamwork. Safety in numbers, always work together. And that is finally starting to pay off. So you have tremendous hope in this generation. I, 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 what's the alternative, you know? But do you, do you see it as a generation that will reach to its elders or across generation? There's a lot, I think, that's going on in that space, too. We're saying, you know, we want to learn from you. We don't think it's just our job that mm -hmm. we want to, you know, come together and work with people of all ages. I think that there are some serious generational barriers on both sides. And a lot of it is language, how we use our words. A lot of it is assumptions about what other generations should or shouldn't do, how they should act, how they should dress, if they should have tattoos or piercings, you know. Uh -huh. All of these things create really strong stereotypes. If we're going to succeed as a nation, and I believe we will, mm -hmm. we have to begin to bridge some of those big divides. What's the number one way to bridge that divide? Because we're in a space where we want to bridge divides. Listen. Listen to each other. Parents and children, mentors and mentees, teachers and students, just really open, honest dialogue. Sexes, gender, mm. race, mm. economics,
come together. We talk a lot about like-minded people, but I think perhaps also what you're saying is, you know, sit and listen to not like-minded people. Yeah, yeah. And that's been the most fascinating part about writing the book, about being with the young people in this generation is, I am constantly put into situations <coughs> where my values are being challenged, my assumptions are being challenged, my cool. prejudices are being challenged. And it's, it's tough, you know, because these young people are very sharp and they put you on the spot and you're like, whoa, I didn't, okay, you know, yeah, yeah. How do you feel, Josh, that you're moving humanity forward? I, I'm hoping that I can just be a tiny little spark, you know, that's, that's my goal. I, when I, I talk about architects of change, I say they are people that challenge what is, imagine what can be, and move humanity forward. What, when you kind of sit back and you're quiet, what do you imagine can be? I imagine a future, not just for this country, but really for the world, where a plurality of peoples from different genders, different races, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different classes, are represented in governance and govern. And from that springs forth a far more equitable society, something that is neither capitalism nor socialism, but has elements of both, something that has the primacy of environmental care as one of its core tenets, and something that doesn't measure success as growth and consumption, but measures provision. How many humans have we provided for? Beautiful. That's his imagination, but it's something that he obviously believes can be. So I think as we leave this conversation, both of these books, Kiss the Ground, How the Food You Can, How the Food You Eat Can Reverse Climate Change, Heal Your Body, and Ultimately Save Our World. And the foreword is by John Mackey, who started Whole Foods. And this is The Revolution Generation, How Millennials Can Save America and the World Before It's Too Late. But I think what he said is something I'd like to leave everybody with imagining the world um, that you want to live in, that you want your children to live in, your grandchildren uh, and your friends, and then go about today making small steps towards making that and what you imagine a reality. And you're doing both with both of these and with your college tour. Great. Thank you. And, Thank and, you and, so much. and folks can find more information about Kiss the Ground. There's a nonprofit that half of the proceeds for the book goes toward, kissetheground.com. And you can join the Revolution Generation Tour at Revolution Generation. So if you're US. a college and he hasn't come to you, community college, university, whatever, um, go there and tell him to come and visit you. Thanks so much. Thanks, nice for, thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much.